I don't know about you, but sometimes at this stage in a sort of afternoon series of presentations, I'm yearning for someone to come on and not use slides and perhaps even talk about something completely different. Uh, well, I'm going to meet you at least halfway. I'm not using any slides. Now, that may not come uh, as entirely welcome news because it does mean you have to listen. Um, uh, and I'm going to start uh, where all good star stories start with the phrase, once upon a time. Once upon a time, uh, there was a head of public affairs at a global tech company called Arm we got an invitation to come and give a talk at uh, Codex. Uh, and the invitation came from Rakesh, whom you met earlier. Uh, and the invitation, I thought this was going to be simple. And the invitation had attached to it uh, a quite lengthy, I think, description. What we would call in old money, two-page description of, of roughly how Rakesh wanted us to approach this. And he said, tell a story. You know, all the stuff you can imagine. Tell a story, engage the audience you know, do a bit of improv, that kind of thing. Um, and I thought, crikey, this is more than I signed up for. Um, but I thought I would take him as a, at his word. Um, and, and I was struck by his suggestion that we try to tell a story. I don't know about you, but when I see the word story, I think of fairy story. Those little childish stories, or childhood stories, I should say, that we heard as children. And I was beginning to think about child fairy stories, children's stories, AI. Quite quickly, you get to the image of a wolf. A lot of fairy stories are about wolves, actually. Uh, and there is a famous, um, Andrew didn't mention it, but there is a famous uh, problem in um, uh, training uh, data to recognize dogs, that they find it very hard to distinguish dogs from wolves, actually, sometimes. Uh, so, so wolves suddenly loomed in my imagination. And everybody knows the, I hope everybody knows, maybe not everybody knows, I shouldn't take that for granted. There's, a, there's an English fairy story about Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, and Little Red Riding Hood, uh, I'm not going to tell the whole story. She goes, she goes to visit her grandmother, and the grandmother, blow me down, the grandmother turns out to be a wolf in disguise as a grandmother. And Little Red Riding Hood gets up to the grandmother, and <laughs> amazingly, she doesn't realize it's a wolf. Uh, you know, she's got a few little, little niggles in her mind. She's got a few little questions, uh, and she thinks, it's a bit hairier than the last time I saw Granny. Uh, and maybe the teeth look a little bit odd <laughs> compared to the last time I saw her, but she doesn't twig. And she gets closer and closer to the, to the grandmother wolf. And of course, eventually, she stretches out her arm, and the wolf leaps out of bed and gobbles her up. End of Little Red Riding Hood. At least that's my version of the story. <laughs> now, there are some people uh, who, for whom, you're wondering when I'm going to get around to AI and trust, aren't you? Don't worry. <laughs> I'm getting there. Uh, you're, you're, uh, there are some people for whom I think the prospect of AI is a bit like that wolf in Granny's clothing. Uh, there are some people who think AI is out there, it's going to be dangerous, it's going to be run by companies that don't have our interests at heart, it's actually going to gobble us up. But right now, they're saying, we are like Little Red Riding Hood. We are the ones putting our hands out to stroke the wolf's beard or whatever. Do wolves have beards? I don't know. Stroke the wolf. The Granny is certainly don't, so that was a mistake. Um, uh, we're the ones trying to give Granny some food, and it's a wolf. We've got closer and closer to it. I'll elaborate the metaphor in case you're not getting it. We're giving AI more and more of our data and stuff. We're giving more and more stuff away, and we don't realize that this Granny is actually a wolf. Now, um, I think that this is uh, uh, an image, a story, a narrative, as they now say, that we in the tech sector should be doing much more to address, and I use the word address rather than contest, but address it, and address the concerns which it, it expresses, uh, uh, the underlying concerns expressed there about mistrust in, in AI. Uh, and my whole pitch, if you only remember one thing from this, apart from that metaphor, the whole pitch is an appeal that, that my company, Arm, is, is launching to industry to come together to build more trust. And I'll talk a bit more about that uh, in the next few minutes. I can see you switching off already, so you need another fairy story. So I'm going to offer you another fairy story. Uh, also has a wolf in it. Um, and this is another English fairy story, uh, first collected in the 19th century. Three little pigs. And I don't know the whole story. But there's basically three little pigs 
living in different houses and a wolf comes along and he fancies pork for lunch or something. So he says, goes up to the houses and I've forgotten now exactly what happens, but it ends up with a wolf saying, I'm going to huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down and he can eat the little piggy, I think. Uh, and the first pig, I think, has built a house of paper, so the wolf huffs and puffs and blows it down and has pork for lunch. And the second little piggy has built a house of wood, huff, puff, blows it away, has pork for lunch. The third little piggy has built a house of brick. Uh, and of course the wolf can huff and puff as much as it likes, but it won't blow it down. And the metaphor I'm going to suggest is that, that we, the tech sector, need to get together and start to build uh, a house of brick, which is a house of trust, essentially. Keep that metaphor. Um, because that's, is, that's really where I'm going to try to take this. Now, in order to do that, um, several things have to happen. First of all, we, we all, we, the tech sector, need to cohere around, essentially, what trust looks like. And right now, um, there are loads and loads of principles on AI ethics, trusted AI, trusted data use, and so on. Practically every big company in the sector has got them. Quite a lot of small companies in the sector have got them. There are lots of trade associations that have got them. I mean, loads of people. The OECD's got them. Uh, lots of organizations have them. So there's a plethora. There are too many uh, of these things, actually. I will say this. Not all of them are very useful, to be absolutely honest. Um, uh, I won't tell you which one, but uh, what, you know, some of them have in them phrases like, and I quote this, AI must put people and planet first. Now, I don't disagree with the rough idea that that is trying to describe, but if I'm running an AI business, I'm not sure what I do with that, right? Because I, I say, guys, did you put the planet first when you, before you thought about this, before you drew up the first proof of concept? Put the planet first? What does that mean? So there's a lot of stuff out there I sometimes say, this is another free piece of advice, I sometimes say when people come to me with these uh, big statements, I sometimes say, can you imagine anyone actually saying the opposite, right? I mean, realistically saying the opposite. And if you can't imagine anyone realistically saying the opposite, you've got to wonder about whether it's really valuable to say what it is you're trying to persuade me to say. So, so although there are loads and loads of these principles out there, we do need to drill down to the, you know, the half a dozen or so, which actually can be operationalized and really matter right now. And this is my uh, next piece of free advice. One of the reasons why you get the AI must put people and planet first approach is that, uh, and others have mentioned this uh, uh, today, I, I think uh, Simi just mentioned it uh, in, his, in the last talk. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about what AI means, right, uh, out there. Uh, and I'm certainly, with Simi, I'm at the low end of it. Now, if you think AI is what Nick Bostrom in his book talks about as super intelligence, so, so AI, wherever we start with it, that moves to general intelligence, which is basically, it's able to think like human beings, roughly. Then it moves on to super intelligence, where it's actually doing a lot more than human beings. If you think of AI as super intelligent, then you're going to come up with a completely different list of, of what we should be looking out for in ethical AI. But actually, where we are right now is way over to the other side of that, of that scale. Uh, and when I think about AI, essentially, what I'm thinking about is a machine. It's not a robot. It's a machine that crunches data. And it crunches loads and loads of data. It does it very fast. And it looks for patterns. And it looks for patterns. And this is the key intelligent bit about it. It looks for patterns where we human beings might never have thought of looking for patterns. Um, and that's kind of where we almost are with artificial intelligence. It's a, it's a broad brush thing, but we're not, I'm not talking about artificial intelligence that's running the world uh, 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 and, and all the other things that people worry about. So I think we first of all need to realize that it's this area, this smaller area of AI that we're talking about. We need to boil down the umpteen principles to half a dozen or so. And I think there are half a dozen. Um, uh, I'll be honest, we, uh, Arm, have just last week published our AI manifesto, which um, we worked on for a while. Uh, and it lists half a dozen or so uh, of these proposals. And they are the ones, more or less, which I'm sure everybody would agree, that you know, AI 
uh, needs first of all to, to, to embody state. I'm not going to I'm not going to express it the way we've drafted it because the way it's drafted, it's all quite careful. But you know, AI first of all needs to be secure uh, because, uh, in a sense, as we heard earlier from from Andrew, you know, security of the network and the system is is constantly subject to threat uh, and attack, and we need to make sure it's secure. It needs to be uh, transparent uh, and explainable. We need to do more with technology. Uh, so that we can develop things like, you know, on, a, on an airplane, you have the black box flight recorder, which can actually retrace what's happened if something goes wrong. We need to look at ways in which the technology can actually help uh, uh, increase transparency and explainability. We need to bear in mind that explainability is not explainability to an audience of geeks, with all due respect to the geeks in the audience. Explainability is explainability to an audience of people like me, perfectly ordinary people uh, who want to know how decisions were made in an AI machine. We need to sort out the issue of liability. We need to make sure that all of our engineers working on AI have done ethics courses. Now that's sort of important because sometimes people say what we really need is a more diverse engineering population. Excellent. We do need a more diverse engineering population, but with all due respect, that's not going to happen overnight. Meanwhile, we need to try to make sure that people designing this stuff are made as aware as possible of the pitfalls. And the, you know, some of it's obvious, some of it's not. A lot of it is unintended consequences. And that brings me to the, uh, the next point, which is um, we all need to make sure that we try to design systems which obviously minimize uh, bias. And I say minimize because I'm thinking not just of legal, illegal bias. I'm thinking not just of is it racist, is it sexist. I'm thinking actually of unfair bias. And that's another very important point. We, we, unfair bias, extremely difficult to define, obviously. It's one of those things. We know it when we see it. But that's the other issue we need to make sure that AI systems uh, are taking into account when they're being designed. Uh, and we do all need, need to, finally, need to take into account the notion of the impact of AI. This is part of the ethics of AI. A lot of people are worried about what AI is going to do to their jobs. And we need to make absolutely certain that we're retraining a workforce that can get little bite-sized chunks of, of jobs in, in, in the digital world. So once we've got industry to come together and agree on roughly half a dozen of those principles, then we will need to work out how to operationalize them. It's all very well having those principles, but if you haven't operationalized them, you haven't even started. So we need to look at the role of uh, ethics committees and scrutiny groups and training of, of engineers and so on and so forth. And then finally, so there's three steps in my roadmap. The principles, the oper operationalization, and finally, some kind of assurance, right? Some kind of assurance. This is worth considering. Will we get to a system where there's, if you like, a, a, some people have suggested this, a chain of assurances so that if you're designing a microprocessor, you're able to say, actually, this has security which will make it resistant to these lists of attacks. And then if you're designing or training an AI, an AI device, you say, this is what we've done to minimize unfair or illegal bias uh, in the outcome, and so on and so forth. And you build up a chain of assurances that ultimately give the customer the assurance that this thing is operating in an ethical way. And my last point, so finally, if we're in the business uh, of designing AI systems, and if we're designing small bits of it, eventually we'll face a situation where our customers are saying, is it ethical? And what they will be asking is, you know, is it racist? Is it sexist? Does it, have you looked at unfair bias? Uh, have you looked at ways in which there may be unintended consequences? Who is liable if something goes wrong? And unless we are able to answer those questions uh, clearly, we may find that we are indeed that little piggy living in a house of paper or straw and not living in a house of brick. Thank you very much. <laughs>